We're going to speak a little bit tonight on the impartiality of God. We've got a couple, bo- couple texts we're going to use, and they're both in Romans. The first is Romans, the second chapter. We're going to go the first five verses. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practices the same thing. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice that thing. But do not suppose this, or man, when you pass judgment on those who practice that thing, and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself, the day of wrath the revelation, the righteousness, judgment of God. What this is starts off with is a letter that Paul wrote to the Roman church. He was not able to visit there himself, so he wrote the letter. He wanted to emphasize the importance of doctrine. The Roman church, of course, is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And the Jewish people, knowing that they're God's people, they thought in their mind that a lot of the judgment that was going to be brought upon people would not apply to them because they were not involved in the immoral practices that Gentiles were. Now you think about that. As far as I know, a sin is a sin. There is no right or wrong with sin. Everything is wrong. And when we come before the Lord and he opens up the book and we look, there's not going to be a place in between heaven and hell. It's either one or the other. And what Paul was emphasizing to him, even though you think you may be a moralist, you are still going to be held to the same requirements that anyone else is. What he was referring to in the very first word of the second chapter is therefore. Well, some people may say, so what? Therefore means it's a continuation of the chapter in front of that. I'm going to read a few verses of that. I'm going to read, excuse me. 26 through 32. And this is the reason that Paul was writing the letter. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passion, for their women exchanged the natural functions for which is unnatural. And in the same way, also man abandoned the natural functions of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts, and receiving in their own person the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with the unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, They are gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolvent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. That almost sounds like the United States and where we are right now, doesn't it? But one thing I want to really emphasize about this whole chapter and the in the few minutes we have together, 
is God looks at each and every one of us the same. He loves each and every one of us, but he hates the sin. He has no tolerance for it. If something may be popular today in our environment, it does not mean it's all right with the Lord. Even though something may be legal, it still is going to be a sin in God's eyes. We must hold on to that and keep that. And this also reflects directly on our relationship with the Lord today. We are very, very blessed at Rye Hill Baptist Church. We are having baptism. We are having people come to know the Lord. But my dear brothers and sisters, let us not get a big head. This is to God's glory and God's glory only. What we find so often today when a church has a little success, everything is turned toward I. We did this. We did this. And God is second nature. No, he's not. He's first. You look at the many people that come into our church, not this church, but other churches. They claim to be Christian, but they are not redeemed. They don't have a relationship with God. They can go through baptism. They can do this, and they can do that, and they are unsaved. Therefore, what God is telling us for us to be conscious of this. Demonstrate to them what a saved individual is. Demonstrate to them the importance of coming with a relationship with Jesus Christ. All the other aspects that we go through in this whole list that we just went through, and we think of other people we might see, conducting themselves like this. But the Lord tells us right here, do not judge. Because if you do judge, you're as guilty as they are. And the Bible, I believe, also tells us to take the log out of our own eye before we take the speck out of somebody else. Nobody here is perfect. Nobody in this room can tell me the exact extent of the righteousness of God because it's unimaginable. We can't ever imagine. We can't even get to it. Each and every one of us, the born-again believers, must strive constantly to be Christ-like. That's a process which we call sanctification. Working toward that. Will we ever get there? No. Not until the good Lord calls us home. And what a glorious day that will be, will it not? It's also a very difficult time to take a person that is a moralist who believes himself better than he is to come and have a walk with the Lord to become a child of his. It is easier for a reprobate to fall on his knees before the Lord and ask for forgiveness than it is for a person that thinks he is just that important. And when you come before the Lord and we're there out of humility, not out of pride, not out of material, but out of humility, to ask the Lord to forgive my sin. And do not ever let it into your mind that you're going to get something past the Lord because he knows everything we have done and everything we've said. So when we come before the Lord to confess our sins, confess your sins. 
Don't try to hide anything from him, because he is going to know. And what happens? He's going to judge. And don't think that we're outside of the spotlight. Every church looks. Every country looks. What are they doing? What are they doing? Why are they doing this and that? It says in the Bible that Abraham, that, or God told Abraham, whoever you bless will bless, and whoever you curse will curse. Here's something I want to tell you, each and every one of you from a personal experience. In the country of Israel, where we live, the parents instructed their children not to watch American television because it's filled with sex, violence, drug, and alcohol. They further said, don't ever call yourself a Christian. Why? Because they relate Christianity to United States culture, which they reflect with their television. What kind of example are we to the world? Do you know what's something else about that? This was startling. This, my brothers and sisters, was scary to me. They said, you know what we call America? No idea. And this came from a doctor. He says, we call America the white Satan because they're corrupt through and through. And he said, if it wasn't for the money coming to Israel, we would have nothing to do with them. Now, do you think we're important? Do you think Israel cursed us? I think it ought to bring us all to our knees. I think it's time to repent, not just individually, but collectively as a country. Because that's the idea that we are transmitting to the world. And who was one of our biggest allies? Israel. It doesn't say a new Fort Smith is going to come from the heaven. No, a new Jerusalem is. It's God's, not ours. So, brothers and sisters, let's get on our knees collectively together and ask the Lord for forgiveness. Ask the Lord that we may be a shining light to this world that Israel will look at us and say, this is a country we want to be like. We can't judge our fellow brother and sister. We can't judge our neighbor because we are as guilty as they are. Last Sunday evening, Marty had a message. He said, are you ready? Are you ready to meet the Lord? If we're there judging other people, raising ourselves to a higher plateau than we are, no, we are not ready. But that is the reason the Lord is waiting this long before his call us home. So the last people in his divine plan will be able to come before the Lord in secret. We're coming close to Easter time. Another few days. One of the most precious holidays in the life of a Christian. A day to celebrate. A day to worship our Lord. There's a story I and this is a true story of an Indian reservation 
And the chief of the Indian tribe was a great, big, strong individual. He towered over everybody in his tribe. He was a chief. He was strong. Another thing with that chief, he was a man of integrity. And during the course, they started to have thefts going on. Could not find out who was doing it. The chief says, if we ever find out, we're going to have the whipmaster deliver 15 blows to that person. And we know what the Bible says, what Jesus went through with the whip. Forty whips they could not do anymore in biblical times because that usually resulted in death. The thefts kept going on. He was getting frustrated. He said, all right, we're going to raise it to 40. We're going to take care of this problem. Shortly after that, they located who was doing the thing. It was his aged mother. The whole tribe thought, what in the world are we going to do? He says he's a man of integrity. Is he going to hold steadfast to the punishment? Or is he going to demonstrate love for his mother? He said, we're going to carry out the 40 whip. They brought his aged mother and tied her to the post. And just before the whipmaster came down with the first blow, he went over and wrapped his arms around his mother and covered her all and took the 40 whips himself. He was the only person in the tribe that could take it. Does that not remind you of our Lord Jesus Christ? He sent his son for what we did wrong. That chief not only demonstrated his love, he also demonstrated his integrity. He followed through. He saved his mother. He saved the tribe. He took the punishment. And we get to celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ this weekend for what happened. He went through a lot more than 40 lashes with a whip. In that song that says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. How could he care for somebody like this? His father loves us so much. Don't ever take it for granted. And let's leave the judging to God. Like the Indian chief, let's wrap our arms around our fellow brother. And let's help him along the way, shall we? We have to be like Christ. Part of sanctification and part of the journey. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, this time of year we're reminded of your love. We can never fathom your love. It's beyond our wildest dream to take a whole, whole country of sinners and wipe away their sin. Father, thank you. Thank you and thank you. Father, we pray Please, we ask that during this season that we will always remember that you are in charge. It is your righteousness we are trying to fill. Pray that we can go forward in this country and be a shining light to them, not just here in Fort Smith, but that it can stretch through the whole country. Let us never become arrogant and self-centered, remembering that each child that comes before you and gives their heart to you, 
It's to be unto your glory and your glory only. Bless this time for the rest of this evening. Take care of each and every one of us in our home and way. Oh, Father, we love you. In your precious Son's name we pray. Amen.